So a very warm welcome uh, to our first ever NHSR community podcast. Uh, my name is uh, Professor Mohammed A. Mohammed. I'm your host uh, in this podcast. I'm based at the Strategy Unit, which is inside the National Health Service in the UK. And I'm also a professor at the University of Bradford and uh, had the honor of being one of the founder members of the NHSR community. Uh, I'm joined by some very special guests today. Uh, and our, uh, our guests and our conversation in this podcast will share some of the history of the NHSR community, try and highlight some of its successes and try and say something about its future uh, with the help of our guests. So I'll first turn to Paul Strone, if I may, please. Paul, would you introduce yourself, please? Thank you, Mohammed. Yes, uh, my name is Paul Strone, um, and I also have the honour of being one of the co-founders of NHSR community. Um, um, I am the president of the Association of Professional Healthcare Analysts, which was formed in 2012 to represent um, analytical activity a- across the NHS and social care. Thank you, Paul. Uh, can I turn to uh, Jenny, please? Oh, thank you very much, Mohammed. So my name's Jenny. I am an operational researcher and modelling development manager in the NHS Wales delivery unit. I also have the privilege of being the chair of the NHS Wales Modelling Collaborative, which is the Wales branch of AFA, the Association for Professional Healthcare Analysts. Um, I uh, have been a researcher in backgrounds, but um, in healthcare for the last 15 years. Thank you, Mohammed. Thank you, Jenny. Can I turn to Ellen, please? Thanks, Mohammed. So my name is Ellen Coughlin and I work at the Health Foundation managing a programme of work that essentially tries to um, advance the use of data analytics in the healthcare system. And for those of you that aren't familiar with the Foundation's work, we are an independent charity committed to improving health and healthcare for everyone across the UK, really. We're funded by an endowment and we spend about £37 million a year on improving health and healthcare in lots of different ways. But the way that the, da- the data analytics team does it is um, by funding innovative analyses, which is what I do, as well as doing other things like in-house analyses and acting as an independent voice. Ellen, thank you. And we'll say more about how, how the Health Foundation has contributed to, uh, uh, to the landscape of analytics through the NHSR community. Um, Chris, please. Thank you. Hi, yes, so I'm Chris Bealey. Uh, I'm a data scientist. I work at Nottinghamshire Healthcare, which is a large provider of uh, community and physical healthcare uh, in the East Midlands. Uh, we do lots of things in my team. I work on some nationally funded projects and I do some stuff internally to my trust as well. We do stats, we do machine learning, we do forecasting, we do all sorts of things like that. Great, thank you very much, Chris. And uh, last but not least, Sarah, please. Hello, I'm Sarah Culkin. I'm the Head of Analytics and Data Science at NHSX. For those who are unfamiliar with um, NHSX, this is a kind of agency of um, NHS England and Improvement and the Department of Health and Social Care that was was formed in 2019 to take forward the Digital Transformation Programme within the health and care sector the team i lead a bit like chris really we do all kinds of exciting things some innovative analytics and data science we support the um, analytical needs of the different programs involved in digital transformation um, and we're also uh, really big supporters of building data and analytics as a profession a, a recognised and wonderful profession within health and care. Thank you, Sarah. That's uh, thank you all to all my guests, really. Um, so, th- as I said, the aim of today is to kind of chart out some of the history of the NHSR community, and it wouldn't be uh, I mean, in one way you can think of the NHSR community as being really a, a kind of arranged marriage, really, between the NHS and our. So let me say a little bit about the NHS and, and little, just a little bit about its history. I'll then ask Chris to talk a little bit about R. And, and like all marriages, uh, they, they cost money. So then we'll turn to our uh, to Ellen to t- tell us a little bit about the origins of the funding that uh, eventually was uh, allocated to the NHSR community. So the NHS is, is a national health service for the United Kingdom. It was founded after the Second World War in 1948. 
uh, it has an amazing constitution. Uh, and one of the principles in the constitution is that healthcare services are for all, all people, uh, based on their need and not on their ability to pay. Um, and you'll see why, uh, for me, this is quite an important touchstone. Um, uh, and the NHS itself is uh, one of the world's largest employers. It has about 1.5 billion staff. And in international comparisons, the National Health Service compares favorably with other healthcare systems in the developed world. So you can see that, that um, you know, we have this amazing institution uh, called the National Health Service. Uh, and that, uh, and I'll now pass over to Chris, please. Chris, will you tell us a little bit about R and also perhaps how you first came to know about it uh, and a little bit about the history, if you're aware of it? Yes, I'm not going to humiliate myself by doing too much on the history of R because uh, it's, um, you know, somewhat uh, labyrinthine. Um, R has got a funny name, I know, because it's based on a programming language called S. Uh, basically, people used to use S back in the day, and uh, it cost money. And like many things that cost money, some Bright Spark had the idea of making a free version, and thus R was born. Um, R is, I think, as many people as use R as there are versions of R, really. R, I, when I think of R, I think of particular things. Uh, I think other people think of, of very different things. Uh, it was born, really, in, in the world of statistics and academia, and that's some of the qualities that it has today you can you can sort of tell that um but the thing that's so special about r from my point of view and from the point of view of a lot of the community is that it's a programming language so it is general purpose and because it's a general purpose programming language and because it can be extended that means that r can pretty much do almost anything you can think of really so it's used widely for statistics it's used for machine learning for forecasting it's used for um data munging uh, so-called you know, data manipulation um you can send emails with it you can build dashboards with it you can make reports with it you know the, the, it's almost impossible to think of something that you can't do with r um and so um it's a very vibrant and of course the other thing is that you know all this activity all these contributor packages are all free so it's a very big vibrant uh field with lots of people in it all contributing their time and their expertise and Chris, I should I should apologise really because the, the question is straightforward. Uh, tell us about R, but actually, it is quite a complex answer now, uh, and it continues to be. Um, but I did want to kind of highlight the point you've made really that just as the health service, uh, the National Health Service, kind of disseminates its knowledge, it's kind of crowdfunded in in, in, in one way, and it disseminates all its knowledge for free uh, uh, throughout the world really. Uh, and our, our and our communities like that, the the number of packages, the amount of online support, the different user groups that exist, uh, and this is all essentially uh, people giving of their of their free time and their expertise, uh, and um, and so from a point of view of trying to kind of uh, arrange marriages, uh, the NHS and R kind of seemed like a really good good uh, in principle uh, fit. But that's not enough, really. We needed to try and uh, we, we didn't have uh, 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 any access to funds uh, when these two things were kind of in the ether, as it were. Um, so, Ellen, uh, as, as the funder of the NHS Art community, would you perhaps tell us a little bit about uh, why the Health Foundation got interested in funding this kind of uh, activity to support the health service? Yeah, of course. So I suppose before the marriage, maybe our romance with R and with the community started back in 2016. So my predecessor um, and sort of founding father of what we consider to be analytical capability, Martin Bardsley, published, um, published an output called Understanding Analytical Capability. And it really set out what he understood analytical capability to be. And that's essentially how data analytics are used in the system. And that's everything from the quality of the data to the timeliness of the data, the analysts, the number of the analysts, their skill sets, uh, whether they're being developed, how they're being organized, and um, you know, the from a top-down perspective as well, how data analytics is sort of valued from you know, system leadership perspective. Uh, it's set up the barriers to analytical capability, so whether that's supply side factors um, or demand factors, um, it really set out all of those um, 
all of those elements. And alongside that publication was the, um, the development of our Advancing Applied Analytics uh, Award program. So really we made available funds to different project teams in different healthcare providers and commissioners that had really great innovative ideas about how they could demonstrate that improving analytical capability could bring about improvements in care. Um, and I think, I think it was in early 2018, we had an application from a collaborative that comprised, I think, Yorkshire and Humber AHSN, uh, University of Bradford, AFA, NHS Wales, and I th a few others, I think, as well. And it was, uh, their ambition was to kind of kickstart the use of art in, in, in the NHS. And the rest is sort of history. And um, when that project ended in 2019, we were able to offer follow-on funding uh, for three years. So that sort of cemented the NHSR trajectory and allowed them to test out things like the NHSR Academy and developing NHSR solutions and hold these really wildly successful conferences every year. And it's just been a real pleasure to see the community grow and really become embedded in the system since then. Thank you, and we'll, we'll cover some of that, um, some of those uh, milestones uh, in a little, little bit more detail shortly. Um, I think it is quite remarkable how uh, it took an outside system perspective to, to kind of commission or support someone with vision and insight to, to write that report. Uh, which actually was quite transformational, really. Uh, and subsequently, there were there were other reports by by other 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 groups, really. But it did kind of um, it kind of identified a major weakness when it came to to data and analytics uh, in the health service. So so there, there will be landmark reports, and I, and I think it's a great tribute to the Health Foundation for for commissioning the, uh, the, those two major reports. Um, so. Just before I kind of, um, so, so the funding now is becoming available through the Health Foundation. I think the, the first round of awards for the Applied Analytics Awards were opened up sometime in 2017 um, or, or, or thereabouts in the summer. Uh, and um, I got invited to an event uh, that Paul Stroner had organized through the Association for, for uh, professional healthcare analysts at the uh, Leeds Cricket Ground in Headingley. Paul, will you take the story from there, please? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> so, um, pre predating that, I think um, I was at that point involved in establishing the National Demand and Capacity Planning Team, and I was also uh, the Deputy Director of Information at NHS improvement and in both of those roles I was getting increasingly frustrated at the lack of um, robust statistical work which was happening and particularly around things like planning and forecasting and um, as luck would have it I was invited to the University of Surrey to, to give a presentation to some people there and um, bumped into a chap from New York University, who was a professor of statistics, and um, and we got chatting over over a pint about all sorts of things, um, which were frustrating both of us. And he put me pointed me in the direction of R as something which I might want to take a look at. And for me, then it was almost like just walking through the door of the sweetie shop and going, "Oh my word, this is just incredible!" And if we could get some of this work established across the NHS and particularly in the teams that I was responsible for, um, it would make life so much easier in terms of efficiency and quality of output um, and all sorts of things. And so that sparked off a whole set of conversations with people around, around this sort of, one of whom was uh, a lady called Julie Viles who was working in Wales, who I think um, was Jenny's predecessor. Um, and we had a chat about about how we might want to get involved in some of this. As Mohammed said then, we had the event in Headingley where uh, Mohammed then presented some work which he'd been doing um, around, I think the shipment inquiry stuff and all sorts of things around mortality statistics and using R. And the amount, just the sheer volume of data which he'd managed to, um, to pull together and churn out 
uh, and to produce outputs from really was just, it just was mind blowing in terms of what we could do with some of this stuff. So um, at that event, I think Mohammed and I um, obviously got together afterwards and we had, we had a meeting of minds and an epiphany at Headingley around, well, why don't we put forward this application? And I'd already started some work with Julie to, to do some of that. And I must admit at that time, the thinking was much, much smaller scale. We were much less ambitious than we are right now. It was For me, it was just about, can we get a dozen folk across the NHS to start using this stuff? Um, and um, was really pushing the train the trainer program approach so that we didn't create a central dependency. So we didn't have central expertise, which we were creating, but we were embedding this within organizations. So that was the plan. Um, so that was really the start of, of the, that was the first application which went through to Ellen at the Health Foundation for funding. Uh, and thankfully they, they said yes. And that was, as you said, from there on, it's, it's history really. Thank you, Paul. Um, uh, I think it might also be just worth me just highlighting very briefly. Um, I think everybody has a personal story of how they met R. And um, in, in, in my case, uh, it was, uh, I was very interested in visualization and graphics generally, um, but uh, uh, Bell Laboratories colleagues from there who invented S uh, actually uh, published a book on visual data visualization in 1993, uh, William Cleveland's book. And it had these immaculate graphics. They were, they were like museum pieces really, and they were adorable. Uh, and I just looked at them and I thought, I'd really want to be able to replicate this. Um, and, um, and later did I find, find, find out really that, that the inventor of the language that helped produce those graphics, uh, when he was awarded a recognition for, for the work he did, the, the, it was stated that time really that the invention of the S language that was used in Bill Cleveland's book uh, forever altered how people would analyze, visualize and manipulate data. And so, um, so I was inspired by, by the visualizations and it still remains a huge, I mean, visualization now becomes such a big specialist area, um, but that's how it started for me. Uh, but S became commercial. Uh, and as uh, Chris has indicated in the nineties, in, in the early nineties, uh, academics from the University of uh, uh, Auckland in New Zealand actually developed the R. Uh, and so I was born. So, so, um, so I was very inspired to uh, to try and promote the use of R. And um, having the opportunity to work with with so many other colleagues to put in a put in a bid to the Health Foundation was actually quite a uh, quite a labour of of love, really. Um, so, if I just quickly outline just a few things that we did in the bid. So, uh, Paul, one of the things that you did really successfully for us was to allow us to network really with a much wider group of stakeholders. Um, just tell us a little bit about how you how you kind of developed that network in the first place. Yeah, so, um, so AFA was created in 2012 um, and it was really um, pulled together to create a, com a community of analysts. And uh, I'd been involved as a research statistician in oncology uh, earlier, much earlier in my career, and uh, used to go to lots of conferences and listen to people present, um, present their work. And it was clear that, that that sort of infrastructure just didn't exist for the analytical community across the NHS. And there was lots of silo work. So we decided to pull AFA together. Um, and very much then it was done on a, on a regional branch basis and getting people to talk to one another within their localities. And um, you would be amazed at how little communication there was at that time, and in certain pockets still is across, across the NHS analytical community. So we had this structure and series of branches. Um, so the meeting in 2017 we spoke about earlier was to launch the, the, the branch for Yorkshire and Humber. Um, I'd been working with Julie and lastly Jenny, Jenny in Wales to, um, to pull that together. Um, we had a big presence in the southwest, which is where we were based at the time. Um, and and so, so that was, so that was uh, well established. And then we had um, 
we launched later London and um, we had a branch in Scotland and a branch in Northern Ireland. And pre-COVID, obviously, annual conferences and bringing people together, you know, in, in a physical way so that we could get them to network together to, with one another and share experience and share their work. So, so similar to what we're doing within NHSR, but in a much more general way. And it was about then, you know, promoting the, promoting the professionalization of analytics um, ac across the piece. So there's lots of work happening to, to bring folk together and to engage with decision makers about the importance of analytics as well. Thank you, Paul. And I think that's really important to, to highlight as a kind of, you know, looking back on it, it kind of, uh, it's kind of, uh, uh, we can provide a narrative, but certainly at the time, uh, none of this was planned. Uh, it, it just came together in a, in a very fortunate way. Um, mm. So, so, um, so we, we, uh, we, we put in a bid uh, uh, and in the bid, I was delighted to have colleagues from Wales be part of that, that kind of, the Health Foundation has a, has a funding footprint for the entire UK. So having, having co colleagues from Wales be part of the bid was actually a, a, a huge asset for us. Uh, and um, we started off a, a program of, uh, of work, which basically involved training people through four workshops on, on how you use R. The first one was introduction to R, and then we gave more specific workshops. Um, but the introduction to R was, was a three-day training program that we, uh, we gave in, in Leeds and in, in, in Wales. Um, I won't say much about this now, but I do still meet people who came to that very first training course uh, and, and what's happened to, to them in, in due course is a, is a kind of nice story. Um, so, so I'll just pause at that point and I'll just turn to, uh, to Jenny really. So uh, Jenny, um, can you kind of recall how you got involved with NHSR community and kind of what what uh, its kind of presence felt like in Wales. Oh, thank you, Mohammed. Yes, yeah, so as mentioned by Paul, I was doing a, a maternity cover. Um, so I joined the uh, NHS Wales Delivery Unit, which is a central organisation working across all of the health boards in Wales, where I got linked up with yourself, Mohammed, um, with that offer of contributing to a health foundation bid. So I was obviously over the moon that this was not going to just be uh, an NHS England initiative. This was going to be made available uh, to those of us outside of that. Um, and it was through that then that it was possible to use some of the networks that my predecessor had set up um, to engage with a range of analysts, some of whom desperately needed that introduction to R, uh, some of whom maybe wanted to join some of the latter training. Um, but we were able to offer that training then across Wales um, and really identify those uh, those contributors to the community that could go forward into the future. So in terms of that sort of initial uh, introduction to the community, uh, I haven't looked back since, I think it's fair to say. Okay, great, thank you. Um, so, um, the, the the first iteration of the of the funding award was to really run four workshops, and uh, just by way of kind of acknowledging the uh, the kind of vision and, and flexibility and responsiveness of the uh, of the health foundation as as, as funders of our community, uh, we came, we kind of we could see the interest that was that was out there, the amount of enthusiasm. And also inspired by by Paul's uh, annual conference for the Association of Healthcare Professionals, um, we thought we'd hold an NHSR conference. So so uh, we put it uh, some extra uh, a request for some extra funding, uh, and we held our very first uh, conference uh, uh, for the NHSR community. Uh, and I'll just quickly highlight. I'll use the conference really as a way to highlight. Um, a sense of how things have progressed uh, for the community. Um, so the first conference was in November 2018. Uh, it was a one day conference. Uh, we were very fortunate at that uh, to have uh, support from uh, industry uh, partners who are interested in data science and working in the public sector. Um, so one day conference, we had about 120 people come. And I think it was the first time I met the person who's written the book on Shiny. So, Chris, do you remember coming to that conference and what it was like for you? 
I do, yes. It's funny because it was, I look back at it now and it was so small, wasn't it, by compar- where we ended up, which is really nice. I mean, it was really exciting to be there um, because, yeah, I'd used art on my own, like completely on my own for a very long time by that point. And suddenly I was in this whole, you know, place full of people who were all using R and a lot of them wanted to learn shiny off me, which was great. Uh, that's my thing, shiny. Um, and yeah, I remember, you know, it was really friendly and great and nice. And I met, um, you know, loads of luminaries of the R community. I remember I met John McIntosh. He was doing a, a workshop there as well, wasn't he? Um, but yes, and it's grown and grown and grown ever since. And if I can just, I mean, uh, for, uh, whoever's organized a conference will probably recognize this uh, anecdote, really, but before you start organizing a conference you always think will anybody turn up uh, and then uh, as 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 you see the the, the kind of uh, uh, tickets taken up as it were you think is my venue big enough um and so so i've ha- we've had that challenge all, all throughout but the really exciting thing for me was to see at that first conference um these amazing individuals Who've, who've done some amazing things uh, with R. Uh, and uh, I just looked at the, the kind of, um, pot- not potential, but actually the capability in the room. And of course we did have potential because we had absolute novices in the room as well. And, and, and that's always, always a, a real uh, fun thing to have. Um, but we, we, I just saw this huge potential and, and I just thought this is absolutely amazing. If, and in fact, John McIntosh wrote a blog for us after the conference and he kind of, to paraphrase him, he kind of said there was enough, enough kind of brain power in the room for any problem to be tackled, providing we could, we could get rid of the organizational boundaries and people could, could, could be liberated to cooperate really. So, so it, was, it, was a, it, was a very, it was a very exciting day. Um, and we had about um, 36, uh, so NHS organizations at that time come to the first conference. Um, so that was great. And then we, ha- we went on to have a, so we have an annual conference now in, uh, in November. So the second conference uh, we decided was going to be two days. Uh, and I wanted a venue for 150 people. Uh, so within an hour, all the tickets went and I had to find another venue. <laughs> um, so we went for a two day conference and we had about three day, 300 people, and that conference was held at the Edge Bassett Cricket Ground, uh, and uh, I had great support from Paul. Paul, do you have any recollections of that conference you'd like to share at all? The, the thing that always strikes me about that conference was the warmth and generosity in the room, and, and the fact that there was no, there was no um, sort of factions or cliques or sort of infighting. Everybody was very generous with their knowledge, and um, and it just, you know, without being all sort of motherhood and apple pie, you just came away with a nice warm feeling after being, I just felt very invigorated having been exposed to that to that meeting. I just thought it was fantastic. And, and I should point out that at all our conferences, we've had technical difficulties and, you know, installation with R and kit not working and so on. So please don't feel that this is kind of a, these are kind of perfectly uh, what a perfect kind of finished articles but as Paul Paul indicates really um, it was it is quite remarkable to see how when you take away organizational boundaries um, and indeed we had colleagues from the health foundation from their data science team as well uh, c- coming to the conference it is just amazing just to see how much energy just uh, gets released really uh, from that opportunity um, so so our second uh, uh, then, uh, then then we went on to our our third conference, which was, um, we had to go virtual because of the, uh, the pandemic. Uh, and in the virtual conference, uh, we had over a thousand people register. And the, the conference took place over about four days of, uh, of talks and uh, a, a one, week, a, a one week of workshops beforehand. This idea of pre-conference workshops actually comes from Jenny. Jenny, tell us a little bit about how that happened, because I'm a real novice at organising conferences and I used to get quite worried about whether I've got things in the right order. But tell us a little bit about why you, you made that suggestion. 
No, I did. Thank you, Mohammed. It's because I'm actually um, a secretariat for the UK System Dynamics Society. And one of the things that we had found useful in the past was that there are lots of students who want to come along to the conference. Um, they um, maybe know that the method or in our case with our the tool might be quite useful. Um, and really, they want to to feel a bit initiated into the community before they get started in in sort of with the techie side with the with the conference. So the system dynamics community every year we have uh, an introduction and a walk through on a model. Um, and so that was what was proposed here. So um, I believe we initially called it R for the terrified, uh, not to imply that people should be terrified, but just that I think there was a lot of imposter syndrome um, within the group. Lots of people really competent, really competent analysts, but feeling a bit uncertain about what might be a new tool in their toolkit. Um, so really great opportunity to, to welcome those to the community and um, run through with people some of those sort of practical issues before then they get started with the conference and then can actually use their time in the conference to have a go as well. So, so that that design change has stuck with us now I think so uh, uh, I, I, call, I, I have kind of brushed ahead a bit by kind of describing the various conferences we're on the verge of, a, of one this for this year for 2021 uh, but but of course, uh, what I forgot to mention was that the first funding bid for, with Howell Foundation was for a one-year project, and um, and as we went through our milestones and were progressing, uh, we actually um, uh, we actually turned ask our funder to consider uh, consider kind of giving us a, a longer life, really. So, uh, Ellen, if you don't mind, could I just turn to you and ask you, um, kind of that transition really from a from a single project fund for a project to this kind of longer term funding for the NHSR community. Tell mm -hmm. us a little bit about how that, that you're thinking on that, please. Yeah, of course. So I suppose at that point we're almost at the beginning of 2019 and we were sort of challenging ourselves to test out different ways to build analytical capability. You know, we've seen that the advancing applied analytics projects of which there must have been 23 funded at that point um, that program was really successful in being able to seed local innovation and funding those really small scale projects that uh, that would build capability locally um, but we started to really think more about the demand side of analytical capability and what it would take to start really stimulating a national conversation about how data analytics should be valued, about what role analysts should be, should be taking in the system. And so we started to think about what kind of projects could do both of those things and develop analysts while also shouting loud enough to kind of get system leaders to listen. And that's where the conversation to the you, Mohammed, resumed, I guess. And um, we started thinking about what our ambitions were and how to build this sustainable legacy. Um, and so, yeah, it just made sense to us that given the rapid growth of the community, um, that NHSR could ably provide that kind of support to analysts that we wanted in terms of developing them as individuals, but also to be able to influence the national conversation, which you have done incredibly well. And also it, it, it needs to be said, it's not easy to be able to take that two-pronged approach. So that's um, where that follow-on follow funding came from uh, in 2019, I think it was. That's great, Helen. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and I should I should point out really that that you know uh, I, I will turn very shortly to to thinking about kind of uh, stories really, which illustrate some of the kind of progress for the NHSR community. But but the energy that has come from members, uh, and we've had support actually from 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 organisations. Both you know, AF has been a, a big strategic partner. We've just um, become had a, a kind of agreed a partnership arrangement with Sarah Will, who I'll turn to in a short while as well, um, but uh, and also from the private sector. But in, in 2019, the industry conference in Europe for R was held and NHSR got an invitation. Um, so I, I, I was grateful for the invitation and I went to have a uh, have a look at how uh, amazing conferences are run in, in, in industry uh, in, in um, 
and I had the, uh, the uh, I had the opportunity really to meet the um, the senior team from our studio, uh, and our studio have been a, a fantastic uh, a partner to us, um, uh, supporting us in all sorts of ways with uh, with the training and development uh, uh, and uh, and our conference as well. So at nearly every conference we get free workshops and and so on. Um, so the reason I mentioned that is that just I, I, the, the progress has really been uh, the coming together of so many stakeholders and players, uh, and perhaps uh, all uh, all the NSSR kind of central team do is just provide a, a kind of central inbox, really a kind of focal point for this amazing energy to kind of uh, kind of collate towards. Um, so I'd like to turn to to my guests now in in, 